to how you respond to that. So I think it's a very dangerous way of going about. So the going more towards that resource-based view, that capability-based view, you, you're more likely to have a more distinctive strategy, doing it slightly differently, which is also has the benefit of more likely of having buy-in and being able to implement, because it's based on what you do well. Okay, so far so good. And that's why 100 a day of those studies identify as a major contributor to long-term innovation. So far, so good. Now, the difficult thing is identifying it, because you can't just ask people, yeah? And that's the tricky thing. You can't just ask people, you get hundreds of answers. Yeah, it's all about design, that's all about sales, all about customer support, because that's what I do, yeah? And so it can't be all of these things, because we all do all of these things, yeah? So, case by case. So the trick is trying to identify it. Would you say that's professional? Hmm? More linear? Delivered linear, and then the fourth space uh, would be more spiraling. <laughs> it's more emergent. I don't know about the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's more emergent, more evolutionary in the sense. But I don't, I don't like the distinction too much because it it makes the right Helm one look irrational. Because in English, you should have uh, in Swartz, uh, scenario planning. So it's yeah. Deliberate, but we do it in several sets. Yeah, again. That SWOT stuff on, on scenario building, again, is very prescriptive. You know, scenario, and we're sort of diverging slightly, but why not? Two, two concepts for the price of one. Scenario planning basically started off as a very powerful exploratory technique. Yeah? It was sort of codified by Shell, but not developed by Shell. But it's almost game theory, isn't it? But it, then it became, but then, yeah, it, then it became exactly, it got more quantified, and then it was about, you know, how, how, how you know, um, the most um, recent one is, you know, options theory that's derived from that. How do you place bets on it? And it got so abstract and difficult to implement now that it's not used very widely outside of things like pharmaceuticals and finance and such like. So, but I think the original idea of scenarios is, is consistent with that. It's consistent with saying, okay, the world is uncertain, but what are the uncertainties? And you create scenarios around that. We have a set of capabilities. How can we survive or, or prosper in these different scenarios? So I think you're right. It's consistent with the original view of scenarios, which was more exploratory. Yeah? It gets to be sort of the portfolio management for Scenarios, yeah, the, yeah. You know. So completely consistent with exploratory scenarios, yeah. Okay, so the trick is how do we identify them? Because if we can't identify them, we can't nurture and develop them, and we certainly can't exploit them. So the sort of, if you like, the bottleneck is trying to figure out how we uh, get traction on this concept. Okay, so we don't want that, all that, all that, all that, all that, all that. That's quite interesting. Okay, so. Um, I won't mention Zara because some of you have looked at that recently, but Zara. <laughs> yeah, what's the answer? <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> uh, I, I, when I put it in, I thought, shall I put it in, shall I not put it in? I thought, yeah, put it in, no, why not? Um, Zara is a good example, um, and, and it's very easy to superficially get that horribly wrong, actually, by the way. No, no, Zara is a good example where. <laughs> Zara is a good example where. You look at it, and it's just a relatively mature sector, and it looks like everyone else. And that. But when you scratch below, as, as many of you have, yeah, you'll pardon that expression, um, you begin to realise it does certain things very differently to others. And then one of the acid tests of a capability is you can do them differently, but does it contribute to value creation in some way? You can do things differently, but worse. Yeah. So differently is one of the acid tests. Is it distinctive and different? And the second one is, and does it create some value that you can identify? And Zara is a good case where, depending on how you analyze the case, um, it's about design, or it's about the network of manufacturers, or it's a bit of both, or it's the use of IT and links back into the design process. Actually, it's probably all three of those things. And that's the third thing you notice about capability, is there are often combinations, or in the jargon of strategy, configurations, but basically they're combinations, yeah? They call them configurations in strategy. They're configurations of different resource sets. So yeah, everyone does design. Yeah, everyone's got a supply chain. Yeah, everyone uses IT and data capture. But do they collect them up in any meaningful way? Yeah. Quite often not. So it's often the combination or configuration of two or three capabilities that create that distinctiveness, yeah? I think Zara's a good example, and many of you are well versed in that. Yeah? So we want to. <laughs> okay. Um, Arm's another one, and um, Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which is slightly less um, off the tongue. Um, and they're interesting for two reasons. Or it might be three, but I think it's two. Two reasons. One is they're in the same sector, basically, but they're in completely different parts of the value chain. And that's the other beauty of this capability approach, is it's not 
the, there are three, it's a triad law, there are three ways to compete. It's often, there are a hundred ways of competing. Yeah, or a thousand. It's very rarely one. So, you know, it's not a matter of simply benchmarking, emulating. It's often a matter of doing things differently. Okay, creating value in a different way. Sometimes in a different part of the value chain, but sometimes the same part, but in a different way. So, ARM, as you probably know, is based in Cambridge in the UK. And basically what it does is two things. It designs chipsets, yeah? low power chipsets based on earlier work in RISC, which is a failed company, interestingly. Um, but more importantly, it licenses it, doesn't manufacture them. So it adds an IP capability to a design capability, deep knowledge of science and materials, a unique combination. Many companies can design chips, and lots of companies can do licensing, but very few companies can do both well. And it's doing very well on that. Yeah, your point. I mean, you should re reveal the history here, because it, I mean, what does ARM stand for? And if you take it to the extent, you have this one device. Yeah. Now, you remember the DVC micro? Maybe yeah, 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 I do it vividly, yeah. The DVC micro in a new global residual part of DVC micro came out of the project. It's mm. large. Mm. It's now in our modern devices. Yeah, but it, also, but it also comes back to this issue of time frame. When you say, is it a successful organization? And people say, oh no, it's product failed. Ha 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 ha. And then you look back and sometimes it's, it ceases to exist. And sometimes individuals or the organization reinvents itself. And I think that's a good example where the original wasn't profitable, the BBC computing. The next one was a disaster, the reduced industrial RISC, reducing construction set computing. A disaster commercially. They tried to produce these low power uh, um, specific chipsets. Uh, partly because of timing, because mobile devices hadn't taken off. And suddenly there's this huge demand for low power relatively simple semiconductor devices, and the rest is history. But that's one s serious set of capabilities that in combination hard. But a completely different part of the same industry, you know, Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, they need a better name, don't they? It's not very catchy. Yeah? And what they've developed over 25, 30 years is all this tacit knowledge in terms of material science and fabrication. They're a pure fab plant. Yeah? They, they claim to do a bit of design, but often they're customer design. So they don't sell end products. They don't design chips. They don't license them. They produce them to order. Yeah? So they build them for Apple, for example, Samsung. Yeah, great stuff. But they way specialize in that tacit knowledge, which is partly a matter of scale, largely the experience curve over billions and billions of units over 30, 35 years, and deep material science knowledge. Again, relatively unique combination, hard to emulate, Okay, but sustainable, not forever, but over a long period of time. So they're examples of what we're talking about in terms of capability. So why should one of those organizations have the same strategy as the other? Because they're in some kind. It makes no sense. Yeah? No. Okay. Um, good. <laughs> I don't even know why it slides there. Yeah. Um, I said Apple in the last one. And, um, we're almost in the last one. But, um, you know, good example where in terms of uh, Google trying to extend its capabilities. I mean, Google has very deep pockets, but Google realized that it had to develop new capabilities, that search was going mobile. And so it set up, well, that's not what it says, but it contributed to the Open Handset Alliance. And part of the purpose was to augment capabilities in terms of operating systems, in terms of influencing mobile device evolution, and it's been largely successful. It wasn't doing it for the benefit of mankind. It was trying to build and develop the capabilities that are at the core of its business. So I think a capabilities approach it's proven empirically to have a contribution, but the trick is trying to identify what these things are. Okay, so the trick is trying to understand how do we find out what these things are. Okay, so let me find out. Oh, that's not very good. Okay, so one way of defining these sort of capabilities or competencies is definitional. And I generally don't like definition, but you could think of them as a series of um, acid tests. Yeah, if you've got to pass these acid tests. A bit like when you apply for a patent, you know, you have certain legal checks. You know, is it an inventive step? Is it a novelty? Blah, 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 utility, whatever the other ones are, yeah? A series of steps to think, well, okay, therefore it's not just something we do, it's potentially capability. So one of the ACID tests is, how firm specific is it? Now, strictly speaking, generally they're not unique. There'd be others who do these things, a bit of design for chips or a bit of IP licensing. But it's often the combination that is unique, yeah? That we can do that, but we can also do that. And you put that together, and that's a relatively unique combination. Okay? Um, they need to create value. It's not just a matter that we're very good at it. And there's an expression one of my friends has is from Halifax in Yorkshire. I won't attempt an accent, because there may be Yorkshire people here, and I get beaten up afterwards. Um, but the expression is clogs to clogs in three generations. 
And the idea is, well, I'm not sure what the idea is, but the lesson is you get better and better at wood turning, creating wooden shoes, clogs, for those who aren't from Netherlands or, or Hebden Bridge. Yeah? But apart from tourists, who buys them anymore? Yeah? So it's one of these areas where the capabilities have been enhanced, but they've got disconnected from creating value. Okay, so that's a reality check. It's a definitional thing. If they're not creating a value in some way, it's no longer a capability. Okay, so it's not just internally focused. But it may mean that you then have to reposition. You know, we do these things well, but it no longer creates value for these guys. Let's step back and you get back to positioning innovation. Okay, we're not making money out of sick children or invalids. Let's sell this syrupy glucose drink to athletes, in inverted commas. Yeah? As an energy group, you reposition it. Yeah. And they are, take time to develop. And that goes back to our discussion about process innovation. Yeah, if they don't take time to develop, then you need to be a bit worried about how easy they are to imitate. And I gave the example of the environmental mud that the, the company produced in six months. I was very proud that it's going to beat the world with it. And then in several other months, everyone else will produce a variant on that. Yeah? Okay. Uh, and as a result of that, again, by definition, they tend to be harder and take longer to imitate. And that was one of our tests earlier on about when does it make sense to be early to market? Well, when it's difficult to imitate, because then you have a window where you can create profitability. Okay? And as we've said, very often, it's not one unique um, resource or capability. It's often two or three in combination that create that unique configuration, as the jargon says. So it's not that we're just good at that and just good at that. We're good at that, and we're pretty good at that, and we can also deliver that. And you put that together, and we can create value in these unique ways that are really quite hard to imitate. So it becomes an internally consistent definition of innovation, uh, of uh, capability. And quite often they're very, this is all a bit jargony, but uh, tacit, we've spoken about the no, tacit knowledge, things embedded in people and systems and processes rather than in documents and, and blueprints and such like. So they're harder to imitate, you know, harder to poach, even if you poach people and, and benchmark and such like. And socially complex just means it's an interaction of lots of people working in strange ways. So again, it's not easily codified. So it's not like ISO 9000, it's more like quality management. Yeah? There's not just a bunch of tools, it's people applying those tools in the whole value chain consistently. And that's quite hard to emulate. Okay? So it's a sort of almost definitional approach, and we find it really quite useful as a sort of acid test to filter to apply to that. Okay. Um, and in terms of um, frameworks, the one that we found works best, ironically perhaps, because we were just talking about consultants, uh, came out of McKinsey's. And I say it came out of McKinsey's because Coyne came out of McKinsey's and developed some of these ideas because his experience was that companies are really very bad at identifying capabilities because they always define it in terms of what they do anyway, yeah, which is very unhelpful. Um, but it's very painful to look at what you do and say, actually, that doesn't satisfy the definition, so why are we doing it? Yeah? Or actually, that's what creates value, but we're not developing it. Okay, so it's a very powerful framework. So, again, don't worry about the language because it's quite, I think, archaic, but it's the principle. And Coyne argues, along with others um, after him, like uh, Richard Hall, Dick Hall from Durham, is that there are four broad categories. Yeah, I'm beginning to sound like consultants. There are not five or three, there are four. Uh, but there are, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's a way of capturing things, yeah, because otherwise we just look at one category and we forget other stuff. So it's like a way of checklist, okay? So there are a bunch of things which Coyne and others call um, positional. Uh, you can call them legacy, call them what you like, yeah? They're things you've got and you've got to where you are in a unique way. Trial and error, past investments, past mistakes, acquisitions. So it's where you are and how you got there. And that's usually very different even to your direct competitor. And some of that is potentially a capability and some of it might be a liability, yeah? There's a bunch of things which are, um, I guess, more functional in the sense they're business systems, maybe processes, technology, depends where you want to put that stuff. Other things which we've spent some time on already, organisational, cultural, climate, leadership, teams, yeah, which aren't easily transferred, more tacit. But, and in isolation, they rarely make a difference. You know, we, tend, we have a, well, say we, you know, Anglo-Saxon cultures tend to have this sort of um, reverence for leadership and entrepreneurs. But when you scratch below you know, an entrepreneur or a leader, often there's a team or a group of people working behind them. You know, even places like, you know, Apple, you scratch below that and there's two or three key people like Johnny Ives, sound like your best mate down the pub, Johnny Ives, you know. <laughs> Jonathan Ives, you know, there's a team, <laughs> it's not a big team, is it? Um, uh, there's the other one, the co-founders, 
was he wasn't, he wasn't. Yeah, he doesn't get involved, but he was the technical guy originally, wasn't he? Because Steve Jobs was a graphic designer originally. That's why he likes fonts being precise and things, or did. Okay, so, and often you get this interaction, two or three people with different backgrounds and talents interacting, yeah? So it's often not just a single thing there. And the last one they call regulatory, and I think that's slightly misleading, but it's mopping up the more legalistic aspect. So it could be intellectual property, it could be um, legislation that prevents competition or prevents uh, or creates a barrier to entry. Yeah, you know, for example, you know, a university, one of the big benefits for universities, which may change after the next election, is it's very hard to get a license, a royal charter, to allow degrees. I think there have been two or three in the last hundred years. Yeah? I think two private universities, one new public university in the UK. So they're hard to get, oh, hold on, you know, they may change. And so that's a, an example of a regulatory one. And the question is, does it add value? Of course it adds value. So, but not in isolation, because there are 130 universities in the UK that can de de deliver degrees. You have to do something else, yeah? So it's often a series of these things interacting. Yeah? Sorry, yeah? Uh, someone explained regulatory policy as simply structures. Yeah? They're already there. Yeah? So you have to work around them. Do you think it's good? Analogy because then, all right, it's, it's like I'm the agent, those are the structures, you know, in, in the social sense. Yeah. And I just have to work around because like, moving them is, is not going to be easy. Yeah, that, I understand what you're saying. I mean, to some extent, yeah, it's sensitive to time frame. I mean, I think the terminology of regulatory is unfortunate because it, I think it covers many other things. Some are, if you like, institutional and in a certain time frame are fixed and you work around them, but others you can influence yeah so it could be that actually one of your regulatory capabilities could be the ability to influence regulation so for, for example um, in the European Union one of the um, more positive things about European Union is a very small bureauc bureaucracy given the budget it has and people may mock that but it actually has a very small central bureaucracy which means it's relatively easy to influence for better and for worse they often have lots of experts they invite in to draft documents and such so it's relatively easy to anticipate and influence regulatory movements in the EU, and they're very slow, so you've got a lot of time to prepare. So I'd argue that's a regulatory capability if you can do that. Some organisations are very good. So the principle is, again, the language I'm not worried about, that, but there are different categories. Um, and it's generally a combination across those categories that, that, that define a, uh, a set of sustainable capabilities. And again, it's not an end in itself. The purpose is to identify these things, so then you can then begin to sustain, develop, and ultimately say, what else could we do with them? Yeah? What other markets and applications, products, businesses could we do with that? And the companies that are really, really good at that prosper over long periods of time. Yeah? Um, 3M's literally a textbook example. Started off as a... Sandpaper or mining. You're almost there. It was mining, then sandpaper, um, and then material science and non-sticky things and materials again, then health and blah, blah, blah. And part of the secret is to define a core capability, which they've enhanced... But it's still basically about surface materials, even now, whether it be bandages or whether it be you know, sticky tape. Yeah? They hate that term, sticky tape, but you get the idea. Yeah? Over 100 years. That's smart. Yeah? So some define the core and they move on. Corning is another one. Corning used to be corning glass. Yeah? Started off, well, you know, ceramics, yeah? making pots and stuff. Then went into glasses, then it went into um, big leap, fiber optics, then into flat screens, yeah, where it is currently a big business. And sort of reinvents the core, still the core tacit knowledge, you know, how do you play around and dope glass in different applications of materials, but there's still a core that you can trace back through that, yeah? And, and they're good examples where, you know, it's not guaranteed because the world dislocates it, but it's a very uh, strong way of innovation over time. So that's, if you like, the framework I'd like us to use. And the previous slide is like an acid test. So when you get to it, 